So he has uh, like little short sessions. Um, if you're in the waiting room, then we are starting in just a couple minutes. Um, so, uh, just wait for some people to get their uh, tech issues sorted. And uh, Steve Myers is going to walk us through uh, the uh, continuation of the talk that he gave yesterday and going narrow and deep as opposed to broad and shallow. I'm, I'm good. I'm good with, with words. I got words. Yeah. I'm good words. Um, okay, so we'll wait another minute or two. Yep. And uh, it's going to be, uh, are you cool with about 30 minutes or, or yeah, less man. even? I mean, yeah. it doesn't have to be. Yeah, I can, I can do, I can talk faster, talk slow. Okay. The thing about doing these, these talks is that you have to like focus very intently. So I'm learning more in this summit than I've learned in any BCB Tales of the Cocktail. Yeah. Because I have to focus on what people say the whole time because I'm invested in it. Right. So your your sort of rate of absorption is much higher than what it would ordinarily be. It's like a fire hose. Like I, like I, I, I produce events as part of my work, but um, mm -hmm. but like this kind of tired is way different than an event production kind of tired. But I'm learning a lot, like a lot. So. Like uh, this guy Rev yesterday, he, he did a talk on on, uh, on uh, restaurant marketing. It's unbelievable, unbelievable. I saw you post about that. I'll have to I'll have to listen to it. I'm sure there's some stuff to be gleaned from that as well. Yeah, I mean, certainly it helps you enter the conversation that's happening in your buyers' minds. That's for sure. Right, just understanding the perspective that they're coming from and, and preempting what they're going to ask and what they're going to need. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if we don't understand what's what's happening with their with their business, then how how can we possibly be of service to them? Mm -hmm. um, okay, all right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we got some folks from all over the world. We got Chris from Prague. We got Eric from Fountain Valley. I'm guessing it's Fountain Valley, California. Um, so, if you guys have any questions, comments, thoughts, ideas, be, sh be sure to leave them in the comments uh, section, and then uh, we will save them for, for after the chat for when Steve is done with his presentation um, and. Um, Oh, Eric, there you are. What's up, man? Uh, and so, uh, so if you haven't yet uh, set up your your account at who'smyrep.net, it's the ultimate directory of beverage and hospitality suppliers. It's really going to help you with your visibility as far as search engines are, are concerned. Um, or you can check out the Facebook group. Um, it's 100 free, both on both both ways. Um, very easy to get yourself in front of prospective buyers. It's very easy to become discoverable for, for buyers. So um, without wasting too much more time, um, here we have Steve Myers from Dynamic Beverage Consulting consultants um they have brought to market some of the world's premier brands that right now and they actually have maintained a level of cool that is um, kind of astonishing so if you've ever heard of mr black um uh, then you've heard of the espresso martini and um uh, steve's strategy that he articulated yesterday actually gave uh, in my opinion gave the world the espresso martini because he was teaching um, cocktail people about coffee and coffee people about spirits Highly engaging chat. Check that out on the replay. Uh, but for now, we're going to go narrow and deep, and, and uh, Steve's going to tell us all about. Steve, you want to take it away? Absolutely. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, as it says on the label, today's sort of chat uh, is sort of a route to market strategy for small and emerging brands, uh, and why you should go narrow and deep um, as opposed to broad and wide, as Jason put it earlier. Yay! I'm smart. <laughs> so this is going to be more of just like a like a chat um as jason mentioned any questions as i go through please feel free to ask them um so underlined at the top you and your brand cannot be everything to everyone and nor should it be um very few brands are created with this in mind but once they do come to market um and i've done this and i'm sure several of you have already is you want to say yes to sort of everyone and everything uh this expands your bandwidth uh, you end up working like a maniac and whilst you do get things done and you may get a very large volume of work done, it's not necessarily as good as it can be in regards to quality. So small and emerging brands really do need to be highly selective uh, in how they come to market with and, and who they work with. And so this then translates into sort of a, a narrow and deep strategy. Um, 
which will allow you to really execute that brand plan that you spent so long sort of working on um, and creating, um, which then in turn allows you to grow your business in that controlled and manageable fashion. Because oftentimes you'll find that when you do bring your, your brand to market, things start moving faster and, and in a lot more directions than you sort of previously anticipated. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the, the founder and principal at Dynamic, Dynamic Beverage Consultants. Uh, I'm an owner, founder, and board member at Illegal Mascal that I launched in the US and about 14 other countries around the world. Uh, I brought Mr. Black to market to the US. Um, most recently, I've worked with Empirical, so the guys who used to run the test kitchen at Noma. Uh, COVID really shook up how they bought their, their products to market. So we, we did a big review and worked out how best to, in a, in a very new landscape for them, uh, bring their product to market sort of on and off premise and online. Uh, and then now there's a, there's a few brands who I think are brands of the future that I'm working with. A Cuban style rum made in Chiapas in Mexico called Rum Palante, uh, which is about to tap into the, the ever growing and increasing Latin demographic in the US and around the world. And Bite, which is a syrup company out of Copenhagen, which is, uh, in the narrow and deep perspective, solely focuses on the on-premise because it's a five-liter bag in box. So no glass, no retail. Cogs come way down, uh, and they've targeted uh, a very specific sort of sector of the market. So what I do is I do route-to-market branding uh, and sales consultancy and execute and help you bring your brand to market. So... The takeaways or today, today's takeaway menu is hopefully will set you on the path to, to building your brand. Um, as I mentioned, this narrow and deep approach uh, will not only help you grow your, your brand in your target market, but the big knock-on effect is will allow you to gather learnings and create a scalable and replicable market expansion plan. Obviously tweaking for specific markets, but it will give you that template and that framework to grow your brand rather than have to um, create a new strategy every time you grow or launch in a new market. So, knowledge is power. We all know this, right? So at a minimum, you must know your brand inside and out. Uh, buyers, consumers, online trolls, everybody is going to question you, your methodology and your brand. So beyond that, you need to know all your financials, um, you need to know your category, as I've put here, history, evolution, position relative to other categories, uh, market share. Uh, the more data that you can have at your fingertips, the better. Um, but what a lot of small brands don't necessarily do is they don't know their competition too well. Yeah. This is just not other brands within your category, but also other brands within your price point, because ultimately you are competing against everything that is on the back bar, in the well, in the fridge, uh, anything that passes over the bar in the on-premise. Narrow and deep means you've really got to know what is your target. So that is your target consumer uh, for both on and off-premise consumption, the drinking occasions. Um, your product or products may have multiple drinking occasions just given the nature of, of your brand and your product. So you should have a, a seriatim or a sort of preferred order in that regard. Uh, On-premise accounts, off-premise accounts types, uh, and then your geographical target and locations. Um, these on and off-premise accounts can be broken further into sort of further specific channels. But the key here is that brands create KPIs in a broad sense, without breaking them down into deliberate, sort of actionable, measurable concepts. So my, my big philosophy is what gets measured gets done. Right? The further you break it down, the easier it is to manage, the easier it is to execute, uh, and the easier it is to get runs against the board, on, runs on the board. Um, as I put down the bottom, too many brands have theoretical grandiose targets that they don't or cannot execute against. So break it down. This is where the narrow and deep really comes to the, to the forefront. Geo-targeting is super key. Um, it allows for great efficiency of time spent in the market, which is, which is one of the 
the least managed resources that smaller brands have. So looking at the US uh, as a whole is extremely daunting. America is essentially about 56 different countries. By the time you break down the states and then the larger states within sort of smaller regions, you've then got three tiers and control states and dry counties and state-specific legislation with tastings and pricing and free goods. Uh, and as a new and emerging brand, uh, this gets awfully complicated and very easily brands can get lost in trying to, as I said earlier, be everything to everyone. So break it down, break it down as much as you possibly can. Going backwards, country, state, city, suburb, you can even break it down to a street in certain examples. In, in Manhattan, for example, you can walk north-south or you can work, walk east-west and you can break down your target markets uh, by individual streets. This smaller footprint just makes it easier to manage initially because what a lot of founder-led brands forget is that they are a CEO. They're raising finances. They, you have so many other hats to wear whilst selling that the better you can manage your, your route to market and your sales strategy, the easier it is, the better you'll be able to get runs on the board, but also run the rest of your business at the same time. Strategic relationships, which was the topic of yesterday's conversation. Small brands need to find the right on and off premise partners. Um, a lot of this boils down to communication and understanding what your partners want as a venue and how you can work together. Um, fewer accounts with a greater rate of sale and a higher volume is far superior than having more accounts with, with minimal sales. Um, this is easy to manage from a brand perspective, uh, and it certainly looks better for your distribution partners. Um, creating brand evangelists within the trade, um, so that is sort of venues and individuals will help be the amplifier effect that you need. You can't create 300 brand evangelists across 300 accounts, but you can create 30, 40 brand evangelists across 50 accounts that you revisit and sort of constantly engage with. Resources. There is only so much time and certainly so much money. And I imagine a few, few of you out there are nodding your heads in regards to your budgets or lack thereof. Uh, so resource maximization. Finances, obviously. Uh, but time. Time is one that's often most overlooked uh, and sort of wasted through inefficient uh, and ineffective activities. Uh, this breaks down into how you spend your time during the day. So geo-targeting uh, and planning your in-market sort of travel. Um, and then also sort of the events that you do. Oftentimes, small brands benchmark themselves against large brands, which they should, uh, but they don't have the, the resources or the time or the finances to just create a cool party you have to have a return on investment. Um, so the more planning and building you can do prior to these activations, the better. Um, so the big opportunity cost really is balancing your time, money, and resources. Ideally, you want to get to a scenario where brands, or where bars, sorry, and restaurants will tell you not to come back, that you're their favorite category X. You're in the well, you're on the menu, they understand it. All their staff have had staff trainings. That it's a, it's a well old machine that is an extension of you and your brand. Then you can move on to sort of the next location. So you're talking about building a flywheel, like, a, like something that kind of feeds on its own momentum. Absolutely, yep. Distributor management, uh, they are a part of the supply chain, whether we like it or not. Um, Oftentimes, smaller and emerging brands um, have more of a reactionary relationship with distributors. So to sort of to course correct this, um, you need to be proactive. You need to provide them with all the sales materials, trainings, uh, direct sales assistance, everything that you possibly can to make sure that it's easier for them to sell your product and you remain sticky and you have that, that peace of mind. Otherwise, you get lost in a oftentimes portfolio that's the size of a phone book. Um, so be proactive 
work with your distributors, engage them as much as possible to build that presence within their portfolio, whether this be uh, working with additional brands or working with key accounts that they have. Uh, but at the end of the day, this will make your life easier and you will have a, a strategic partner within your supply chain. Um, in addition to sort of managing the distributors, small and emerging brands should look potentially at third-party sales organizations. Now, I know that no one will sell your brand as well as you, um, but with the consolidation of distributors around the US, third-party sales teams have become a viable option for brands who need to have a greater footprint within the market. Learnings. Narrow and deep gives you learnings. 100 accounts selling one bottle each doesn't create learnings. But if you go narrow and deep and build relationships and learn how to work with the on and on premise, you understand how your brand can grow within these specific channels. Uh, repeat sales strengthens the brand positioning, uh, obviously builds your business, but also allows you to learn menu and drink strategies, what works best in respective channels, uh, consumer adoption data, what drinks are working better, um, what, are the, what is the trend, what is happening consumption-wise. Uh, you create a, a bank of information and in how to work with trade partners, knowing that cocktail bars operate differently to chain restaurants, that independent liquor stores, again, are different to the total wines of this world. Um, continued sort of narrow and deep execution creates content. Referring back to the selling one bottle into 100 accounts, you do the same thing 100 times. But if you sell into an account and then you get a happy hour menu and then you get a regular menu and then you get in the well and then you do activations, this is a... This provides you with sort of a, a chronological brand development and all the learnings that come with that rather than repeating the same step over and over again. Uh, it provides real world experience for you and your, your team. Sometimes your team is just you, uh, but it helps you understand working with accounts and distributors and all the learnings that you get from that, how best to position your brand, how to understand their needs and what they're doing and where the market is moving. Um, it helps you understand your pricing and your skew mix if you have more than one product. And these all add up to allow you to, to build your brand in a scalable and rec replicable way. So the, the more that you can create a template and a structure as your brand grows, then it is easier for you to say yes to more and more people because you have that foundations and you have that route to market strategy that you can then replicate. Any questions for anyone? I know that oh, was... yeah, man. Oh, we got tons of questions, man. All right. Um, all right. So I'm going to set this up into Q&A mode real quick here. That's all right. So Q&A. So um, uh, how do you niche a brand that has more geography than the ability or bandwidth or staff, human capital to service their distribution? So that, that returns back to the you have to, you have to learn to say no. Now, fortunately, um, with the growth of online sales, you, what you can do is you can make your product available um, within sort of multiple states to reach the largest online presence possible. Uh, and communication, inform your, your customers, your potential customers, that you're only available online in these states uh, and that you sort of you keep them abreast of how and when the brand is growing. Um, so oftentimes consumers will get frustrated if they can't get it, but if they know they can't get it and there's a reason why, then that's, they're a lot more understandable or they will try and source it from a different state. Okay. That makes sense. Um, is there a, a benchmark for how many outlets, um, uh, is there a benchmark for how many outlets per salesperson, especially in a, a dense area like NYC? Is there, is there a formula for the bandwidth of any one person to service a market? For a narrow and deep, um, I would suggest probably having a net, a net capture of about 80 accounts uh, with, a, with a key focus on about half those. 
40. Okay, so one person can, so, can so hit sort of and manage. And, with, with good menu and good velocity type traction. Okay. Um, Eric, does that answer your question? Um, all right, I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, so what are your thoughts on fractional contract head of sales for early brands? Uh, so, certainly open to it. Uh, that's very much down to uh, what's the what's the time allocation, what's the resource allocation, um, working with them for their for their targeted results. Um, as I said, sort of when you are a founder led brand, you have you have all the hats on. Um, if you can have someone who can contribute because of their Rolodex or their ability to get you through the door. Uh, then absolutely use that. That's why I said there's been a there's been a rise of sort of third party sales organizations like like Evo Beverage. Um, that I think if you look at some of the large distributors, it's something like eighty five Southern Wine and Spirits. Eighty five percent of their sales comes from about seventeen brands, and they have a phone book. So you know that going in, you know that you have to do the sales, and ideally they. They deliver what they say they will. Uh, so yeah, using using a consultant or broker of sorts um, or a fractional salesperson uh, is definitely something the brand should look at, especially yeah. if your history is from branding and packaging and design or distilling. Um, you literally just cannot be everything to everyone. Right. Well, I mean, I, I mean, just my, my thoughts on this are that like, uh, especially an entrepreneurial or brand owner, like they're effectively operating as an agency that has a product. So it's like, like a hybrid of, of, a, of a CPG product, um, but they're also providing a service and a delivery that, that delivers that product. So it's like, if they're not thinking, um, if they're focused on the packaging, marketing, distribution, routes, market, that kind of stuff, which they should be, um, then they can't possibly focus, then they may not be able to possibly focus um, on the systematic approach to um, producing um, a sale, like as in a single sale and then scaling that in, in a meaningful way. So if you're, uh, so I guess in other words, I'm saying like, if you're going to hire a, um, a third party sales management agency or broker, that you're basically licensing their system so you don't have to do it yourself. Correct. So it's, it's almost like the optimizing your resources. And what you need to remember too is that some, some venues will take three, four, five visits to get over the line. And so the, the opportunity cost of financing your next round as opposed to revisiting a store for the fourth time, um, you need to work out what's, what is your priority. And if you can have someone who has those relationships and can get your product in the door and you, you manage them proactively and appropriately to create that target account list and that geo target area that you want, then yeah, I, I think it's definitely worth exploring. Okay. I mean, but you are, you're also releasing control of their day-to-day -day activities, right? You are. And so that's the, that's the trust in the, in the partnership that you have. Uh, okay. Well, speaking of that, that, that particular question, um, there, so what is the day in life of the, like, what is a day in the life uh, in terms of time allocation for a narrow and deep rep who is adopting this philosophy? You know, what do they do? What, how do they spend their time in say eight hours a day? I think so. You're better off looking at it from a, from a weekly type perspective. So uh, front end of the week, you map out your accounts and where you need to go. Um, so you have the list. You then break that down into the areas. There's, for example, in New York or LA, there's no point spending all day on the subway or in the car. Right? Be as effective and efficient as you can. Uh, you then sort of determine the priority scale of the accounts that you have. What are your targets? What are the ones that need revisiting? Um, are there any in that neighborhood that are just worth a check-in? Um, and then note, that um, when you're visiting the accounts, when is the when is the window to present? Obviously, for example, off premise, you can usually get in and speak to a decision maker earlier in the day than on premise, where there's usually just sort of prep people, and so there is a much shorter window between sort of doors opening or management being there to to line up to venue opening. Uh, so plan your day sort of accordingly around that, uh, and then. 
sort of the next sort of I guess segment of the day is the is the staff training and education concept, where I am I'm a big proponent of informal staff trainings. You cannot necessarily book a time period for management and or staff before lineup or whatever it may be, uh, but if you can sit at the bar and engage two or three bartenders and a server and hand on heart legitimately say that you gave them a good brand educationary experience um, that counts as a staff training for me so if you do it right you can visit an existing account show support do a staff training potentially engage in with some customers at the bar at the same time so you're able to sort of sort of tick the box on multiple kpis at the same time okay all right you got a co-sign from chris on that um, all right. So, um, all right. Next question. We got a, a scenario here. So we're a mixer brand targeting on-premise first. Mm -hmm. We say no to off-prem up front so they can focus 100% of efforts on on-prem, um, even though there's interest from off-prem today. So what they're, what they're saying is like they're, they're uh, a mixer brand. Yep. They're, they're wondering whether to, to decide on or off premise. What would you do? Um, yeah. I it's would, a, for a mixer brand, I would do both. Uh, purely because of the drink strategy that I generally execute for off-premise is um, keeping it simple, right? People like to make good drinks at home. They don't necessarily make balanced ones. Um, oftentimes, they make them stronger than they should. So if you can provide a really tasty, simple serve for the off-premise, um, you will get a lot of traction. Now, depending on where you are, that's a little more difficult. For example, in New York, off-premise liquor stores cannot sell non-alcoholic products, but in California and other states, they can. Um, so I would, for that example, I would look at sort of high-end, depending on where you are, high-end independent grocers as your off-premise. Um, but when you partner, ideally, with liquor brands, have them use your product in their in-store tastings so that you can be a recommended uh, brand of choice. Uh, and that way you can sort of use that philosophy when you target the on-premise as well. So you have consistency of, of drink strategy across the on and off-premise. Interesting. Okay. So, um, all right. Uh, you mentioned informal training as a great support tool for bar to, to bartenders. Um, what are the support tools bartenders and on-premise outlets are looking for? What's the appetite? What's the demand for, for the, these kind of trainings? Uh, I think you'll find huge. One, so you'll get, the, you'll get the category of bartender who wants to sort of pursue this as a career. Uh, so they're very much about education and learning. Um, but of the, of the sort of the people who use hospitality as a, as a bridge to a future career or as a, as a temporary type placement, um, educating them from the philosophy or the perspective of them being able to sell more and thus make more is, is key as well. All right. So there's sort of, there's two education type, the, the super nerdy where you get well, well into your product. Um, and the other one is where you sort of educate more about the brand and the drink and how it moves and how it sells and how it's going to be beneficial to that particular venue. Uh, and so You'll know that from the type of account it is and sort of the type of sort of questions and engagement that you have with with sort of the management and staff. Okay. Um, last question. We're, we're running out of time here. Um, what are some of the key metrics uh, an on-premise account is looking for from a new brand? So they're looking for a value-add proposition. They're not looking for another SKU. They're not looking to try and sort of squeeze room in the storeroom for an extra extra case. It's how how can you and your brand add to what they want as a venue? So whether that is increasing sales numbers, which probably is to bringing new uh, interesting type of clientele to the business. So when you create your target account list, rather than just look at it from I want my brand in venue XYZ, it's like, what can you bring to that venue to help them be bigger, be better? Um, and so the more successful they are, thanks to you and your brand, the more successful you will be. 
Okay. All right. Well, Eric, um, Chris, I hope that answered your questions. Um, if there's any other thoughts, ideas, questions, or, or anything else, uh, be sure to leave them uh, in the comments or uh, reply to any of the emails that we've sent you. Um, Steve, you want to take us out? Yeah. Uh, just any any Council Chinwags Consulting. Um, there's my name, website, um, email, and phone number. Uh, please hit me up anytime. Uh, and thoroughly enjoyed presenting today. Thank you all. All right, cheers, guys. Um, again, if you haven't if you haven't set up your account with, at Who's My Rep, um, we head to Who's My Rep .net for a free account. Um, that's uh, the ultimate directory of beverage hospitality beverage and hospitality suppliers. Um, it will help you get found on the internet um, as opposed to just being found by a friend of a friend or somebody who knows somebody else. Um, I hope you're enjoying the summit so far. Um, the next presenter is April Wachtel. She's going to talk about how she um, has a built a conscientious brand. Um, and uh, and that's impact on the world and what she's you know to hoping to accomplish. So I hope to see you there. Then after that we have Rob Ortiz at three o'clock Eastern time, and he's going to be talking about how he um, uh, builds niche spirit brands uh, with uh, St. George Spirits. So um, kind of a kind of a piggyback to this one, but this is going to be specifically how he does um, uh, does creates demand for St. George Spirits. So um, Steve, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you guys all showing to the Supplier Summit and coming up strong. Um, and I hope to see you very soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.